Good afternoon. Just a few reminders. Assignment one, which is basically some statistical analysis, is due on Friday, 11.59 PM. If you need the grace period, let me know. Just send me an email, and I will happily, happily adjust your <clears throat> due date so you can um, have the extra time. Uh, participation question two is due at the same time. So what we uh, will do today is an overview lecture, which really prepares you for lab one. What I'll have you do is work in breakout rooms with your lab mate um, after we go through this to really talk about what are you going to try and accomplish in the lab? I've posted the lab write-up. I apologize that I didn't get it up earlier. Um, I thought I had things under control uh, till about an hour and a half ago. Um, but the lab is posted. We'll, go, we'll talk about what you're doing in the lab. We've talked a little, a little bit about it on Monday in terms of the red water, in terms of the type of measurements you're doing. And the lab really, right up, really goes over all of the details regarding that lab. So what I want to do is look at how do we begin to determine what the sampling plan, the monitoring plan should look like. So the first thing we need to think about is what is the issue? Now, we've said with the first lab, the, re the issue is, is red water. And that's on campus. So that's our issue. That's for lab one. The issues will vary with each of the labs. So the next one, question we want to ask ourselves is what information is available? So what in information is available to you as you start to proceed in the, with this lab? And where can you get that information? So feel free to unmute yourself right in the chat. What information do we have? Or where can you start to look for that information? You haven't sampled yet. So you're at the situation you're in right now. Okay, you can go to the library. You could look at possibly if there anything on lecture notes. Did I post anything online, Kappa? Um, in the lecture notes, I talked about the consumer confidence report, otherwise known as a water quality report. You could look there. You could look. Has anyone done a thesis or dissertation and actually looked at water quality? You could perhaps go to the operator. Okay. So the question is, okay, what information can we get before we even start to go out and sample? Next question we want to ask ourselves is what is the goal of the study? So based on what I talked about on Monday, what is the goal of this study? So the difference with your these labs, okay, and it's not just to do an analysis. So you're not going in, okay, today I'm going to determine hardness. I want you to think more holistically, more globally about what you're doing. So what might be a goal of this study? 
Okay, we could have a study where we actually looked at how red water can affect the health of the people drinking it. Much more global study. Is there a way to prevent red water? <clears throat> we maybe we could, goal could be to assess the water quality in a particular area and see if we can figure out why water quality the water quality is what it is. Why? What extent do we have red water? Is it building specific? Is one building worse than another? Is it location specific within a building? Why is it occurring in that particular location? So before you ever go out and take a sample, you want to know why you're sampling. Okay. The other thing that we can ask are, are there any regulatory or legal issues? So we talked about MCLs. <clears throat> Anyone remember what MCL stands for? Okay, the M is for maximum, C is for contaminant, and levels. So it's maximum contaminant levels. So for instance, the red is called caused by iron. We can find out, is there a standard for iron? Some cases, often iron is associated with manganese. We can determine, is there a standard? These are actually secondary contaminants. Okay. That means they're aesthetic. They're not a health-based standard. So there is no enforcement of a regulation for iron or manganese. <clears throat> now, the next thing we wanna do is begin to plan the study. So let's think in this case where what we wanna investigate is the effect of car, tra car traffic on NOx, carbon monoxide, and PM 2.5 levels on campus, okay? So that's what we're looking for. We're looking to assess that. Where, where are we gonna sample? Or what is the population or area of interest? And why would we be concerned with this? Residents of East Lansing. Okay, so we worry about the actual residents of East Lansing. Anyone else we wanna be, we wanna worry about? Feel free to unmute yourself. I know it's hard to have a conversation, but Maybe the animals and species also in East Lansing, other than just the people. Okay, we could worry about animal species. We could worry about plants, effect on pollutant and their effect on or stressing plants. Okay. Anything else? Anyone else wanna? I said on, we're on campus. We could worry about it, the effect on the watershed. So we're really worrying about, so in this case, we're talking about air. So we could worry about the drinking water, but our drinking water is groundwater, so it's not likely to have an impact. It could impact um, if we have deposition in the river. So it could impact the river watershed. What else might we, okay, so we've got this, pro, this situation we're looking at. We're looking at the effect of car traffic on the levels of NOx, carbon monoxide, and PM 
focus on East Lansing, we could focus on campus. So we define an area. What next? How do we proceed? You're the engineer. This You've been tasked with addressing this issue. Now what do you do? Okay, find the, find the areas of most <clears throat> concentrated levels. How would I find that? How, how might I start with this study thinking about locating the areas where I'd expect to have the highest concentrations? We're talking about air. I switched it up on you. So we're, ta we're talking about the effects of, okay, so we could put in a, the traffic counter strips, I'll call them, I'm not sure what they're called either. Um, so basically, exactly, more cars, more air pollution. I could look at Google, it'll tell me the traffic patterns. I could look at where are the highest traffic locations? I could do traffic counting to try and find what the traffic locations, what those traffic locations are. So basically I'm trying to get information in order to determine where to sample by the traffic lights because cars are idling, they're there longer. So you're looking at something about the physical environment. You're researching that site history. Maybe there's literature on this. And then that, that information now is used in making a decision about what to do next. Where do I sample? How do I develop this plan? So I can start thinking about where are my samples? As mentioned by the traffic lights. I could sample perhaps on Grand, Grand River in um, the, the long, either along Grand River. I could sample in the green strips in the middle of Grand River. Um, do I want to say, if I'm worried about the effect on people, I need to think about what height. I don't want to sample two or three stories high because that's not what people are exposed to. I want to be sampling in their breathing zone. So I need to think about that. I need to think about what is the spatial boundary that I'm going to look at. So how far I'm going to just focus on campus. Am I going to focus on East Lansing and campus? What are my what boundary will I use for this study? <clears throat> what is the scale of the measurements? How many measurements are my, am, am I going to take? Can I take three? Is that representative? Do I need to take 100 in order to get a representative sample? How long am I going to sample for? If I sample during the summer, I'm going to get a very different set of results than in September. Correct? Or if I sample over the winter holidays, I'm going to get a very different result than if I sampled in November. So I need to think about the duration of the study. I need to think about what chemicals I'm going to sample. So we said here we're going to sample NOx, particulate matter 2.5, and um, carbon monoxide. Yeah. Also with the duration, we need to think about how, what is my sampling interval? If I want to compare these to a regulatory limit, 
For instance, it's actually NO2 is the regu regulatory limit, but that has an eight hour average and a sorry, it's carbon dioxide that has the, <clears throat> and a one hour average. So if I look at the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, look for carbon monoxide, the regulatory limits are based on an eight hour average and a one hour average. So I wanna make sure that I have enough data in order to determine those values if what I'm trying to do is to compare that to some regulatory limit. So thinking about that is an important consideration. So we've talked a little bit about where to collect. Think about spatial variability. Okay, how do we just collect on Grand River? Do we collect along the river, on the river path, trail? It's gonna give us very different results. They're both potential exposure locations, but the results and the, the exposure will be different. It's about when to connect, collect. We're gonna see temporal variability. We need to think about how to collect. So how are we going out and collecting these air samples? Or how are we going out and collecting these water samples? How many samples do we need to collect? And all that is really okay, dependent on what are your objectives. So that's why the first thing we need to do is think about what is the objective of our study. So now when we're thinking about sampling, okay. Before you, and my goal in all of this is to help you when you go out, you're on the job and you're told to do a sampling study. How do you begin to do it? Okay. Again, we need clearly articulated objectives. Without that, we really can't go anywhere. From there, we'll identify where are we going to sample? How are we going to collect those samples? We need to make sure we can get those samples back to the lab. If the sample vials break on the way back to the lab, you might as well have not gotten, gone out there and sampled. You've just wasted money. How do we anal analyze the sample? Some cases we need to analyze in the field. Do we need to process the sample before we do analysis? You're gonna see that when you measure nitrate, you're gonna to have to do a little bit of processing of the sample before you even begin the analysis. Can we store the sample? And if we can store the sample, how do we store the sample? At what temperature? In what kind of container? Does it have to be stored in the dark? Is there an expiration date for how long we can keep the sample? How do we discard that sample? Is it safe to just dispose of it down the, down the drain? Have we added something to it so that it becomes a hazardous waste and we need to dispose of it as a hazardous waste? Or was it a hazardous waste to begin with? The goal is to create statistically valid, validated data. If the data can't be statistically validated, again, there's no sense collecting it. So in this planning stage, and you're gonna do some planning today, I'm gonna to have you work in small groups and see how far you can get with that. Um, you can take a look at the lab, it's online Kappa. And you're gonna think through Okay, where are you going to sample? Okay, what are, you, what are your goals? How many samples are you gonna collect? What type of samples are you going to collect? Can you preserve those samples? Can you store the samples? Can you transport the samples? With regard to water, 
most of this information can be in a manual called Standard Methods for the Analysis of Water and Wastewater. It's on its, I don't know, something like 28th edition. Um, it tells you how to preserve sample, how to collect samples, what kind of containers you can use, how to preserve, how to store, how to wash those containers. In many cases, how to transport this. If it's not there, it's typically US EPA has methods. If you're dealing with a regulatory issue, you'll typically follow US EPA methods. ASTM also has methods. In this course, I will give you the methods. Critical to what you're doing is making sure you have data that is both accurate and precise. So something that is accurate and precise, if you think of a bullseye, it's right in the middle. Okay. Here, this is precise, but it's not very accurate. Here, this is both imprecise and inaccurate. And here, if we average this, it'll be something close to the mean. So it'll be accurate, but it's not precise. So this would have a high standard deviation, for instance. Thinking through your steps, we're looking now at sampling. Is there particular equipment you need? So for instance, if you're sampling out in a lake, you may need one set of equipment. If you're trying to sample sediment in a lake, you need a different set of equipment. If you're doing air sampling, you need a different set of equipment. So thinking through, okay, I've got an objective. What kind of equipment do I need to collect that sample? What kind of container do I need? Do I have to preserve that sample out on the site? Do I store, how do I store it during transport? How do I store it when I get back to the lab? How do I ensure that while I'm doing all of this, I'm protective of health and safety? Chain of custody. Talk a little bit more about this, especially when you're dealing with anything that has a regulatory reason for sampling. You need to know who had the sample at all times and where was the sample at all times. So that chain of custody documents all of that. Lastly, we need to think about cost. Back to the sample in East Lansing, or sampling East Lansing and camp, campus for air quality. If we sample three locations, that's gonna have a very, very different cost than if we sample 100. Well, how many samples can we afford to sample in order to achieve our objective? So cost will, uh, in the real world, when you're out there sampling and you're designing these sam any sampling plans, cost is going to play a significant role in how you actually end up conducting the sampling. Analytes. So what are you analyzing for? Now, for the lab that you're doing, the goal was the or the objective is to understand the relate to be able to predict red water using LSI basically 
the Langlier saturation index. So can I use the Langlier saturation index to predict whether I have corrosion and a red water problem? So you're going to look at LSI calculations. Does anybody remember from Monday, what analytes are you going to measure? You need calcium. We need temperature. We need alkalinity and conductivity or TDS, total dissolved solids. So those are the parameters we need to measure. There are different analytical methods. Your lab gives you one set of analytical methods to use, but there are very others that you could use. Can we store the samples? Can you collect the samples on one day and then do the analysis on, the, on another? Do you have the equipment to do the analysis? We could measure calcium by atomic absorption spectroscopy. We don't have that in the lab. We could use ICP, inductive, inductively coupled plasma. Don't have that in the lab either. So you have to think about what are you going to measure and how are you going to measure it? Do you have what you need? Is there a standard operating protocol? You have a set of instructions for how to run the test that you'll be running. That's your standard operating procedure. If you're doing this for, in reality, there would be a quality assurance plan. So there would be some controls, maybe some blanks. You want to know that that data is accurate and precise. Okay, So the lab would provide that data. And you want to make sure that dur during the analysis, you're protecting human health and ensuring a safe environment and also protect protecting environmental health. Another thing is, how will the data be managed or stored? You're going to share the data amongst your classmates. How are we going to do that? I'll set up a Google form, and you'll add the data. And we'll create a set of data. Okay. Now, it's really important when you put in that data that you identify where you sampled. If I just put, I sampled on the third floor in a water fountain, on a water fountain, is that sufficient? What information do you think we need in terms of this data logging? So for your lab, you're going to measure those four parameters. What data should we include in this table? Is it just sufficient to know the building? Or will you want some other information? Okay, it's not sufficient just to know the building. So what other information do you want? We're in the building, okay? And it's really critical exactly where. The water fountain across from room 1234. Or the water fountain across from room 3546. Okay. Do you need you want some so that somebody can go back and actually replicate what you did, know exactly where you got that sample. Okay. Time that you got the sample. The day you got the sample. If you remember from Monday's photo where I showed you the picture of the coffee mug with the red water. That was early January. I think it was January 5th. Okay. How you took the sample. We need to make sure that we're all taking the samples the same way. Did you flush, for instance, for three minutes before you took the sample? Or did you take that first flush from the sample? That's going to play an important role. It may very well change your results.
Did you sample from the hot water tap or cold water tap? Another thing that we want to think about is who has access to the data. All of you, if we do it together, collectively have access. Do we give access to anybody else? Probably not. Ultimately, maybe. Um, but thinking through, and it depends on the type of data that you're taking, who has access to that data. Are there tools you need for the data analysis? For assignment one, you can do a lot of the analysis by hand. It's explained in the videos. You can also use the data analysis tools on Excel. And it'll take a lot less time if you use the data analysis tools on Excel. If you don't have the down, if you haven't done the edit, downloaded the add on with the data analysis, you won't have the tools. So thinking through, do you have the tools? Are they available? You may need at home to use remote access to access the, um, the data analysis tool in Excel. And then thinking through who are the end users? Who's your client? I've been, you're told who your client is. Who's the audience? It's going to impact what you write or how you write your report. When we're sampling, we also need to think about bias. I mentioned whether you flush for three minutes versus whether you took a first straw. If you only sampled after a holiday, you'd get a very different result than if you were sampling throughout the semester. So thinking through how you buy, potentially bias your samples. With the air quality study, looking at carbon monoxide, NOx, and um, particulate matter, PM 2.5, how might you bias that, that, those measure, that measurement process? How, or how might you bias your study? What are ways you could do that? I mentioned some of them. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Okay, so thinking through the, or thinking about our air quality study. Okay, so we're trying to measure NOx, carbon monoxide, and <clears throat> particulate matter from traffic on campus East Lansing. What are ways I could bias that study? Well, could it be like some of those emissions could be admitted from things other than just cars? Okay, so some of them could be emitted from other car cars. So, okay, not studying the traffic all day, only studying during rush hour, I'm gonna get much higher results. And it's gonna look like the levels are significantly higher than they are as an aggregate throughout the day. What else could I do? How might I, how might I achieve values that are significantly lower than what would represent what a student is exposed to walking to class? If you sampled in the summer. Okay, so if I only sampled in the summer, Depend if I only sample during certain weather events, what else could I do? What if I what if I set up all of my sampling stations along the river trail? Would that be representative? No, I'm going to get art artificially low results. So thinking through what you don't want to bias your results. So thinking through what are the potential sources of bias and trying to avoid those biases. We can also collect what are referred to as grab samples or composite samples. So grab sample is what you're going to obtain for lab one. They're the most common type of sample, they're the easiest ones. 
you go to a tap, you fill up a bottle, and you've got a sample. You don't need any special equipment. You have a container, you go out to the red cedar, you collect a sample of water, then you bring it back to the lab to analyze it, to grab sample. We have some grab sample sampling devices here. It's just simple, a bottle on the end of a, st a stick. This is a sampling device where you can lower it to a certain depth and then you pull on a string. It opens the ends, fills it up, it closes it, and then you pull it back up again so you can sample at depth. You can see this person sampling in a stream. This is referred to as an Ekman dredge. It's used to sample sediment. So we're going to drop it down. It closes, it's got a clause, closes, pulls up a sample from there. We can also have a composite sample. So we can take a number of samples taken over a period of time or over a spatial, some spatial distance, and then we mix the samples. So you could go around to the engineering building, you could collect four 250 ml samples, compile that all to an, a liter, into a liter container, you'd end up with a liter, mix it up, and you have one sample representing engineering. Useful? Why would we do that? Why, why might we consider taking that approach? Okay, so we, we've taken four samples. We now combine them into one. Okay. So we've got one sample now instead of four. If we did it over a period of time and we did the same thing, we may see temporal changes in the building water quality as an aggregate. But why, why not just measure, do the analysis on all four samples? Maybe there's something in the first sample that was missed in another sample. So potentially, okay. Um, and we'll give an example in just a little bit about that. Okay, why else might we do it? it has to do with cost. If the analyses are extremely expensive, it may be beneficial to combine those samples and then do one analysis. And sometimes analyses can, one sample, analyzing one sample can be $1,000. So it may be that doing a composite sample makes sense. Major thing is the samples need to be the same volume or the same mass. If they're not, you need to take into account that. You could collect samples by a variety of means and try and see if that composite is representative. And as I mentioned, it reduces the analytical costs. It does provide an estimate of a mean concentration, but you lose that, in the case, my example, you lose the spatial resolution. If I were to collect samples Wastewater epidemiology, sampling a residence hall for COVID. They could take samples every hour, combine that into one, and then get a temporal aggregated sample. So you lose the time variation, but you obtain for instance, over that 24 hour period, is there significant COVID from, or do we see COVID in the wastewater from that residence hall? When you're looking at this in terms of, so for instance, with the wastewater, you get the aggregate, but how might it affect 
terms of you're taking the same same volume sample, could it miss high concentrations? What sort of biases might you introduce that in that situation? So think about the res hall. You're going to take a sample from the wastewater every hour, and then you're going to aggregate the 24 samples. So you're going to do the analysis on one sample. You lose the temporal variability. Is that acceptable? Somewhat depends on what you're looking for. Do I want to just know that is there potential source of COVID in the dorm? If it happens to be that that person isn't in the dorm, that has COVID isn't in the dorm, you're going to miss them. It may be that they're only in the dorm for a short period of time. They only use the restroom for a short period of time. They use the restroom elsewhere. So you miss that. Okay. So there's some loss in, in information by doing that. The other issue is that you can, in some cases, when you're actually mixing the samples, you can lose contaminants, especially if you're dealing with volatile chemicals. So if those chemicals evaporate easily in that mixing process, you can lose chemical. So I've mentioned the wastewater example is over time. I take samples over a period of time and I aggregate those. I can also collect samples, and this is a spatial distribution. So I'm looking at a plot of land, potentially contaminated. I can take a number of samples, I aggregate those, and then I measure. So I'm getting a mean concentration over this particular area. Now, when you're sampling, you can also sample based on different approaches. Okay. All of these are actually based on a systematic, statistical. Simple random sampling is not random. Stratified random sampling is not random. Every, these are all based on a systematic statistical approach. Random sampling. It's based on a statistical design and each sample has to have an equal chance of representing the whole. So I can use a random number generator. I could divide up my area into grids. But you're not just, for instance, walking down Grand River and every once in a while taking a sample. If you had a portable CO monitor, maybe you take samples every 200 feet and you know where you're starting and you're taking samples. Okay. You've, you've randomly selected 200 feet and that's within your statistic, your approach. It gives you the information you need and it's within your budget essentially to collect those samples. Stratified random sampling, you're dividing the area, whatever you're sampling, into parts. And you want each of those strata to be as uniform as possible. They don't have to be the same size, but the number and the number of samples is a function of the variation in the strata, so basically how variable is it. You're basing this on prior knowledge or judgment. So for instance, if you're looking at a water body, we have the epilimnion at the top, we have a <clears throat> um, benthic zone at the bottom, we have a hypolimnion, we have the mesotroph in the middle, we sample, we're sampling 
within that hypolemnia, or sorry, the epilemnia. We're sampling within the hypolemnia. We can sample as a function of depth or a function of salinity gradient. We could sample at the middle of the stream versus the edge of the stream. But you've decided on what the strata is before you go out and you sample. You could sample on the first floor of the engineering building, the second floor of the engineering building, the third floor of the engineering building. So that could be your strata. Your strata could be the new wing of the engineering building versus the old wing of the engineering building. So you're, you're making your decision of where to sample based on designation of, of these strata and you're keeping your analysis separate. So I'm not going to compare. If I'm going to aggregate samples, I'm going to aggregate everything on the third floor. I'm going to aggregate everything on the second floor, if that's what I'm looking at. If I'm going to aggregate samples. <clears throat> Systematic samples are collected in regular intervals in space or time. And the sites are collected on are selected based on professional judgment or knowledge. And they may be biased. So for instance, for lead and copper rule sampling, the requirement is to sample what are referred to as tier, tier one sites, sites that contain lead plumbing. So where the service line contains lead plumbing. Does that bias my results? It also says to collect the first flush. Does that bias the results? So lead and, <clears throat> lead and copper rule sampling. We collect from what are known as tier one sites that contain a lead service line. So they contain lead in the plumbing. And we collect from the first flush. So we allow stagnation to occur. <clears throat> the water stagnates in the pipe for six hours. And we collect that first flush. Does that bias the result? Okay. We got one yes. Anyone else? And the answer is yes. It biases the result. Is that acceptable? And the answer is yes. Okay. Okay. The reason it's acceptable. And there's only there's is that the way that the regulation is written is that you're not, it's not a health based standard. You're trying to determine whether or not there's optimal corrosion control treatment. You want to determine the worst case. So the worst case is someone gets up in the morning, the water's been stagnating overnight and they take a drink of water from the tap. That's going to have the highest concentration of lead because it's stagnated. It's had time for the lead to dissolve from the pipe or be released from the pipe into the water. So the way the regulation was written was that bias is acknowledged and it's actually built into the standard. The way we measure chlorine residual in a drinking water system is to measure it at the farthest, furthest ends of the distribution system. So where it, essentially where the water age is the longest, where it takes the longest time to get from the plant to the consumer's tap. We've biased the sample by doing that. But we've written the regulation in that way. Why? Why would we write a regulation to sample those locations? Why do we have chlorine in our water? It's a disinfectant. 
So we want to ensure that we still have a disinfectant when that water gets to your tap. So by measuring the furthest tap, we know, OK, if it's closer to the plant, it's going to have disinfectant. It's going to have a chlorine residual. So we look at the fur. We, we systematically bias the samples in order to ensure that we do have a disinfectant furthest or at the greatest water age in the system. With soil sampling, we can do similar sampling. And here, it's a simple rectangular grid. Samples are taken at the nodes here. We could have a triangular grid. We could have a hexagonal grid, we can collect these samples. Now they, this is going to give us a spatial distribution in the site. Depending on the cost, we may type, we may aggregate samples. Here in this case, it's an excavation. And the walls are sampled. Notice it's a systematic grid. It's not random. Okay. But it's a systematic grid in that excavation pit where samples are taken. Here, what's done is we've got a triangular grid. And then everything within this square is then aggregated. So we have a distribution, a much finer distribution. <clears throat> and this is typically known if we done if we don't know where the contamination has, occur, has occurred. But because of the expense of analysis, we aggregate all of that samples within that square grid. And I know it's getting long, so I'm going to try and get through this a lot quicker. OK, in terms of sample preservation, we need to think about how to preserve the samples. So for, in, for instance, metals can absorb onto glass. Organics may diffuse through the top of a container or the sides of a container. Oily materials can absorb onto plastics. So that will. These types of factors will determine what you use for sampling. Preserving samples is also important. For instance, if, vol if you're sampling for volatile chemicals, you don't want any headspace. If I, here's my sample vial, and here's my water level. Sorry. So here's my water level, and I have volatiles. I can end up with chemicals diffusing, volatilizing into the headspace. And then when I go and sample the water, the concentration is lower than what is what I what was actually there when I measured. You also don't want to agitate it because again, that may result in loss of volatiles. You also don't want to freeze the samples because then in thaw thawing those samples you can lose volatiles. <clears throat> With one of the things to note is pH is always measured in the field. And that's because your sample can absorb carbon, carbon dioxide, resulting in a decrease in pH and therefore a change from actually what you measured. Typically with metals, we acidify to pH 2 because the metals can react with oxygen, they can precipitate, or they can dissolve. So we can have significant changes there. Organic species can react. They can photoreact. So then we use an amber bottle to try and prevent light from entering that sample vial. They can react with chlorine. So for instance, if I'm measuring disinfection byproducts, I want to dechlorinate so I can have reactions during storage, 
or transport and storage. Chemicals can biodegrade. So we may actually store at high pH or low pH. I store at low temperature to try and prevent my <clears throat> biodegradation. Or I can add something to a bacteriocide to kill in its microorganisms to prevent degradation. Sample preservation with soil sludges are not as well documented as that for water, but typically the same guidelines will apply. And then when I'm transferring, I need to think about how to package them, how to transport them. In some cases, Department of Transportation regulations will apply. In other cases, DOE regulations apply. Atomic Energy Act regulations if they're radioactive. Packaging is important. There's a little story here that they took acidic samples from a mine site. They put the sediment samples in plastic bag and paper bags. The samples actually had a pH of about one or two. By the time the samples got to the lab, the, the paper bags had all dissolved and they had one gigantic aggregate sample. So what do you do? You have to go back and start again. So you've lost that money in doing that. So making sure that your samples are in proper containers, they're sealed, they're in Ziploc bags in case container breaks, they're in bubble wrap if they're glass in glass containers, they're packed securely, they're on ice if they need to be on ice. So packaging is critical. <clears throat> Mention the chain of custody form. This is an example chain of custody form. Every time that sample changes hands, it's documented on the form. Making sure your samples are recorded, they're marked properly, they're labeled properly, and knowing what your holding times are, the procedures, those are critical. You take a sample and you hold it for too long before you bring it to the lab, potentially that sample's lost. So attempt to give you some sense of how do we do the sample. So what my plan is for the rest of the time, what I have set up for you is for you to work in your teams. You've got the lab right up now. What I want you to think about, and I haven't assigned the building, um, We'll think we can look at the chemistry building, Anthony, engineering. Um, if you're living in a residence hall and you have access to the residence hall, that could be a building. Um, I'd like to know where potentially where you'd like to sample. If there's a particular building on campus that you would like to sample, uh, write that down. I will ultimately let you know where, where you will sample. But I want you to think through. Look at the lab. Okay. Think about trying to answer as many of these questions as you possibly can with your lab mate. Okay. If you have a building that you want to sample, write that down. I can see, I can see what you're working on because this is a Google form which I have to pull up the other file with the Google form. So I can give you that information. Okay. The goal is that next week when you come into the lab, you can say to Joseph and Emily and Kayla, this is what I'm planning to do. I am planning to sample this building, I need X number of bottles, 
I need those bottles need to be a certain volume. Okay. So I'm not going to give you the recipe. I give you the information, but not the recipe. So I want to help you get to that point where you're the engineer that you can go out, you've designed the study, you can go out and you can implement it. Okay. Difference is I'm giving you all the information. 